Hi, in this video, we're going to be, this series of videos, we're going to be working through a GCSE paper. Please do stop the video, have a go at each of the questions, then compare your solutions. Each of the videos is going to be about 20, 30 minutes or so. It should give you about an hour's worth of fairly focused revision. If you're not sure about anything, always add a comment. I'll come back to you and I'll look forward to seeing you inside the video. OK, so here we are through to question number 18. Now, question 18 and towards the end of the paper are going to be a little bit more challenging. So please do stop the video, have a go at each of these questions, add a comment below and I'll always come back to you if you need any help. OK, so what we've got here is the function of x equals 2x cubed minus 4. And then we're asked to find the negative function or the inverse function of 50. So that's what I'm going to do first. What I'm basically going to do is work out the inverse function of x. Now in order to do that I would the technique I would use is I would make y equals 2x cubed minus 4 and then basically I need to make x the subject. So if you can imagine what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 4 to both sides then I'm going to divide by 2 and then I'm actually going to cube root it and that will give me the value of x. Now while I do appreciate I've gone through that extremely quickly please do let me know if you're not sure OK, so when I've completed to that particular point, what I effectively do is I change everything back again. So what I'm going to end up with is going to be the, well, the inverse function of x is going to equal to the cube root of x plus 4 all divided by 2. OK, hopefully that's OK with you, that particular technique. So therefore, I've got to demonstrate that the inverse function of 50 equals 3. Well, 50 is going to be the value of x. So therefore, I'm going to end up with the cube root of 50 plus 4 divided by 2. So that's 54 divided by 2 is 27. Cube root of 27 is going to equal 3. And that would be the answer to that particular question. OK, so let's move on then to part B of the question. And it says uh, that g of x equals x plus 2 and h of x equals x squared and find values of x for which. OK, the bit I'm interested in, at least initially, is the h g of x. So what I'm basically doing is I'm taking the g of x and I'm putting it straight into the value of h of x, which happens to be x squared. So therefore, I can write the left-hand side as x plus 2 squared and that equals the information we've been given which is 3x squared plus x minus 1. OK, so let's uh, now solve this for x. And the first thing I'm going to do is on the left hand side I'm going to expand that to x squared plus 4x plus 4 and that equals 3x squared plus x minus 1. Now in order to solve it I need to factorise it and make it equal to 0. So what I'm going to do is bring across the terms on the left hand side. So I'm going to get 2x squared and then I've got plus x minus 4x is going to give me minus 3x and I've got minus 1 minus 4 is going to give me minus 5. OK, now there are a couple of different techniques you can use to actually factorise this particular equation. However, what I would do is multiply 2 times negative 5 and that's going to give me negative 10 and I'm looking for two numbers that when I multiply them together, total to make negative 3. And those two numbers are going to be positive 2 and minus 5. OK, so let's rewrite this equation as 2x squared. And now I'm going to write it as plus 2x and then minus 5x minus 5. So I haven't changed any particular values. What I've done is I've actually uh, just changed the middle two numbers or changed plus 2x to minus 5x is going to be minus 3x. But it does allow me to factorise the first two terms. And what I'm looking for here is a common factor, which in this particular case is going to be x plus 1. Because 2x squared plus 2x I can factorise in that particular way. And then if I take minus 5 out of the second two terms, I get x plus 1 again. Which means now I've got a common factor of x plus 1. And I can rewrite this as 2x x minus 5 multiplied by x plus 1. OK, I do have a separate playlist on this if you need any help. However, I've now got two solutions. My two solutions are going to be x equals positive 5 over 2 or 
x equals negative 1. And that would be the answer to part b of this particular question. OK, please do add a comment below if you're not sure about anything. OK, let's move on then to our question number 19. Our question number 19 does deal with indices, and I have posted a playlist on this fairly recently. OK, so the first thing is, is you'll notice that on the left hand side we've got negative a half. Well, that basically means the square root of 9, but it's actually the reciprocal because it is the negative. So it's 1 over the root of 9, which is actually going to be 1 third. OK, let's look at the second one. Well, I've got 27 to the power of a quarter. Well, I'm going to be working in base 3. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to write that as 3 cubed, which which is 27 to the power of 1 quarter. So I haven't, again, haven't changed the value. I've just made everything 3. Just makes my life a little bit easier if I'm then I'm dividing by 3 to the power of x plus 1. And remember, what I'm trying to do here is find the value of x. OK, let's just tidy this up a little bit. So what I've actually got is going to be 1 over 3 is equal to... OK. 3 to the power of 3 to the power of 1 quarter is going to be 3 to the power of 3 quarters. OK, and that's divided 3 to the power of x plus 1. OK, what I'm going to do now is cross multiply these. So if I cross multiply, it gives me the, uh, the ability to write 3 to the power of x plus 1, and that's going to equal 3. Now remember this is 3 to the power of 1, so 3 to the 1 multiplied by 3 to the power of 3 quarters. OK, so if I've got that, I can actually just write it the other way around, so that 3 to the power of x plus 1 is equals 3 to the power of 3 quarters multiplied by 3 to the power of 1. And don't forget we add the indices, so therefore x is going to equal three quarters and that would be the answer to question number 19. Okay, my plan is to complete this whole uh, paper on this particular video, so please do have a go at each of these questions. Let's move on then to question number 20. And it says the graph of y as a function of x is shown on the grid. And then it says on the grid, draw the graph with the equation y equals function of x plus 1 in brackets negative 3. OK, so basically what we're doing is that x plus 1 has the effect of moving in the x direction in the negative direction. And then minus 3 is uh, 3 jumps down. Down. OK, so hopefully this will come on the screen OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of these points and move them along one and then three down. So that's going to give me that point there. And actually what you'll find is you should be able to trace the graph through fairly well from the point. So one and then three down. OK, and there it is. All righty. And then I'm going to look at, say, this point at the top here, the very top one, one, two, three down. And there it is. So what I end up with is a new graph which looks oh like that. It isn't the tidiest thing that I've done, I'm afraid, but hopefully it'll give you some idea um, of the new uh, line. OK, then as a final question, it says the point A, negative 2, 1, which is actually, if I just change my pen colour here, is actually going to be this point here, uh, lies on the graph of y equals function of x. When the graph y's function of x is transformed, OK, and we can see right at the bottom there with the equation y equals x function of negative x. Now that's basically a reflection in the y-axis. So all that's happened is this point A has moved along two places and it's actually at this point now. So it becomes point, uh, I think they call it point B, and the coordinates of point B are going to be 2 one. And that would be the answer to that question. Again, there is a playlist on transforming graphs if you want to have a look at it. And apologies, this uh, particular drawing is a little bit untidy. OK, so let's move on then to uh, question number mm, 21. 
Uh, sketch the graph. Now this is one of those things where it's going to take a little bit of time to work through but it says show the coordinates of the turning point and the exact coordinates of any intercepts. Okay well let's have a look at what we've got here. So as soon as I see the words turning point what I'm going to do is actually complete the square. So my process would be firstly to complete the square for uh, 2x squared minus xx minus 5. So if I just work through that, what it'll do is it'll give me my turning points at the end because I can write that as y equals 2. I'm going to use big brackets and that's going to be x squared minus 4x minus 5 over 2. So what I've actually done is I've divided all of the terms through by 2. OK, so if I complete the square for that, I'm going to get two, again, big brackets. I tend to use these square square brackets and that just really helped me then to be able to focus and concentrate on the things that I need to concentrate on. OK, I'm going to end up having to negative 4 there and then minus 5 over 2. OK, so let's have a look at what that looks like. Well, I'm going to get 2 big brackets x minus 2 squared and I've got minus 4 minus 5 over 2 is actually going to be minus 13 over 2. Now I'm very aware there will be some calculations that need to take place off screen. OK, but what you should end up with when I tidy all of this up is going to be y equals 2 x minus 2 squared negative 13 and that would actually be the completed square form. And the advantage with that is it tells me that the turning point on the graph is going to be positive 2, negative 13, positive 2, negative 13. So that's one thing that I can actually put onto the graph. OK, so the second thing that I need to put onto the graph is actually the values of x or where x crosses the um, the values of x where it crosses the um, x-axis. OK, so where it crosses the x-axis is where y equals 0. So effectively, I can write 0 equals 2 x minus 2 squared minus 13. And what I'm going to do is then really just complete the square for the, uh, not complete the square, I'm going to solve for the value of x. So I've got that uh, multiplied by 2, so I'm going to divide everything through by 2. No, I'm not. I'm going to take this negative 13 and put it over here. I've got 13 equals 2 times x minus 2 squared. I'm going to divide through by 2 and I'm going to get 13 over 2 equals x minus 2 squared. OK, and then I can square root both sides and effectively I get plus or minus the root of 6.5 equals x minus 2. OK, if I then add 2 to both sides, I've now got two values of x of where it crosses the um, x-axis. So the first one is x equals 2 plus the root of 6.5 and x equals 2 minus the root of 6.5. OK, now appreciate they're not particularly easy to deal with, but if you can imagine very roughly, I would say that the root of 6.5 is about 2.5. So I'm going to say that's approximately a positive value of 4.5 and this is approximately a value of minus 0 0.5 and that gives me two more things that I can draw onto my graph. The second thing or the final thing that I can draw onto my graph is where it actually crosses the y-axis. So crosses y-axis. Now if we go back to our original uh, equation which is y equals 2x squared minus 8x minus 5. OK, well, it crosses the y-axis when x equals 0. So if x equals 0, y must equal negative 5. OK, and that's where it crosses.
All right, so I'm in a position now that I can put these things together and I can draw a graph. It's not going to be the best graph in the world, but hopefully it'll give you some idea of how this would work. It'd be something like that, okay, where this value is going to be 2 minus the root of 6.5. This value is going to be 2 plus the root of 6.5 this value here is going to be negative 5 and then the turning point which we'd already worked out before is going to be 2 minus 13 and I do absolutely understand that that's not the best graph in the world but hopefully it will give you some idea of what this particular question will look like. Okay so let's move on then to the very last question on this particular paper and this is a proof of congruency and this is quite tricky I think because uh, there's quite a lot going on but basically um, I think a few things to observe. Firstly, it does tell us that triangle AED is an equilateral triangle. So if it's an equilateral triangle, it means the sides are the same and also each of the angles is the same. It must be 60 degrees. OK, so that's the first thing I would use. And I think like a lot of these things, what you're doing is just looking at what information you've got and trying to find a way to prove that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DCB. So let's just mark those triangles up. So ABC is going to be this triangle here. OK and DCB is going to be this triangle here and what we're doing is proving those triangles are exactly the same. Well one of the things that you can see BC is common to both. Okay so that's a fairly quick that it's a common side. Okay, so BC is common to both triangles. Okay, the next thing I'm going to look at is that I think I would probably say that angles on the same segment are equals. If you look at uh, BC, then it, what it would mean is that this angle and this angle are common to each. OK, they're from the same segment, so therefore we can say those two angles are equal to each other. OK, we can also say that angles that are also equal to each other are from the segment AD. So that's the opposite side, but what it basically means is, is that this angle, if I just fill this in, is also common to this angle over here. If this is the same segment, so then it would also mean that this angle is going to be exactly the same as this angle. This is going to be 60 degrees as well. Now the reason being is it's from the same segment of DC. It also means then that this angle, which if I put a little line above it, is going to be the same as this angle. OK, now you need to probably be writing all of these out. The final thing I think is also this is going to be 60 degrees because its opposite angles are equal. OK, so therefore we can actually say that our triangle uh, BCE is an equilateral triangle as well because they're all 60 degrees. OK, so what have we got? Well, We've got that BC is common to both sides. I think the other thing that we would say is that angle ACD is equal to angle ABD. OK, so therefore it's an angle relationship and that's absolutely fine. OK, and then we can also say that because our triangle ADE is equilateral, we can also say that angle ACB equals angle CDB and that is an angle as well. OK, so therefore we've proven that both should be congruent or are congruent because of an agreement on side angle 
angle and that would be the answer to question number 22 so quite a tricky one to end on if you're not sure about any of these if you drop me a comment below I will endeavor to try to explain this one a little bit further okay please don't hesitate to uh, let me know what you think to the videos and I'll look forward to seeing you inside the next video